within biblical faith, history has purpose and meaning. It's going in a direction. We've looked at various religions and worldviews, haven't we? We've looked at Hinduism, where history goes round and round and round. We've looked at Buddhism, where history goes round and round and round. We've looked at African traditional religion, where history comes from the past to return to the past, from the past to return to the past, from the past to return to the past. We've looked at um, Confucianism, where you should look back to the Lee of the, of the ancestors. Not look forward, but look backwards to the Lee of the ancestors. History, culture, not developing and moving any way forward, looking rather to the past. We've looked at Islam, where you come from paradise to return to paradise. Come from paradise to return to paradise. There's no movement forward there. There's no kingdom coming in the future. History just hangs in a parenthesis within the Islamic understanding. All of these are very significant when it comes to the understanding of an approach to development work, you see. Within biblical faith, in contrast, history starts in a garden and moves forward to be consummated in a grand city, the fulfillment of God's kingdom forever and ever. And in our churches, whenever we pray, we've mentioned this several times, whenever we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come, your will be done. This is a prayer for moving forward. I mean, when you pray that prayer Sunday morning and you really mean the prayer, when you go out to your workaday world throughout the week, you know that you are participating in God's grand plan, in God's kingdom, which is leading us all forward toward that great day when his kingdom will be fulfilled forever and ever. That's the call to movement forward, you see. A sense of hope that indeed things can be developed, things can be improved, we can move forward. Real, honest development is indeed a possibility. So all of those streams, all of those streams it, 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 it are, like, are like, a, um, like a tree that nurture the scientific worldview. I look at it like this. Here is this tree of science. And there are roots that go into that tree which nurture this great, wonderful gift of science. The conviction that God created, that's one root of the tree. God created the conviction that the earth is real, another one. Another one, that it is good. The conviction that we are created in God's image and therefore can think God's thoughts after him. We can understand how it's put together. We can do scientific investigation and explore the way the creator formed it, you see. Another root. Created in God's image. Commanded to move forward. Commanded to develop the good earth, you see. Given authority to name the animals. I mean, all of these are different roots that feed this wonderful tree called science. And so, what we're saying is that the parent of the scientific revolution is biblical faith. You don't find a scientific revolution taking place outside of a culture that has not been formed by biblical faith. Sci the scientific revolution, when you look at the original history of the movement, of the scientific revolution, all of them in various ways, have been significantly formed by biblical faith. Now, I don't mean to say that in our modern time, with all the cross-fertilization of ideas and so forth, that people become scientists who are not formed by biblical faith. Of course they do. But the original seed, the original um, um, impetus, the original mental, psychological, spiritual revolution that enabled this phenomenon of science to develop was rooted in biblical faith.
especially Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. But then, watch out. There is the fall. That within biblical faith, it's not just that we can develop this good earth and that we should do so. But here in the center of the garden is a tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now that tree means many things. But surely one thing it means is nature. So here is this tree in the center of the garden. The tree of science, you might say. Right there in the garden. And what happens is Adam, Adam and Eve decide to take the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is to say they have decided to look to science rather than to God for their authority. They look to science rather than to God for their moral decisions. It's God who created all of this. This wonderful tree has formed. <laughs> it's great. But Adam and Eve choose not to honor the creator of it all, but to put the tree itself at the center of their authority. So what has happened, and this, 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 this reality just permeates the whole world, where scientism or sometimes the literal worship of a tree, of nature, that's what we've been talking about in this class, nature worship, where people will take natural phenomena and bow down to it and worship it and so forth. You know, that is putting the tree, putting nature at the center. But another way of doing it, putting nature at the center, is to say science will become our final authority. And so what happens is instead of instead of rejoicing at the wonderful gifts that have come our way through science and thanking God for those gifts, what happens is that people cut down the tree, they cut off those biblical foundations, just sever them all, and so here is science without any spiritual, philosophical, theological roots. And science, instead of becoming a gift, becomes scientism. Which means the ideology of science now becomes our authority. Karl Marx says it very, very well. When he says, dialectical materialism is our authority. Dialectical materialism is our authority. What's he doing? is saying that science <laughs> will be our authority. Materialism will be our authority. And so Marxism took this wonderful creation and turned it into the ultimate authority. Instead of God, the creator, being the ultimate authority, it now becomes science that is the ultimate authority, and that is scientism. So I make a difference between the two. When my mother and father went to Tanzania and mother began that medical clinic, she was not worshiping the medicine. <laughs> she was not saying this medicine is my ultimate authority. Never, never, never. In fact, every morning when she would give out the medicines, she would have a time of prayer. And she would pray with all these dear mothers who were there with the sick babies, whether they were Christians or not Christians. She would say, let's pray. God is the healer. And so they would pray together, and she would lead them in prayer to God, our loving Heavenly Father, who created all this wonderful world and who created the um, insights into being able to understand uh, the source of these illnesses, you see. And so they would pray, and then she would give out the pills and so forth, you see. She wasn't making scientism her authority. No, no, no. God was always at the center. You see. So that's what's happening in, mod in the modern world. This, uh, this uh, placing of, of, of science itself or of nature itself at the very center 
instead of instead of instead of God. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Seminary's database, please visit tvsseminary.com.